Hello, this one's gonna be a little bit different. Instead of just reviewing a game, I'm going to talk about the making of an every SNES RPG episode, and really just my process for reviewing games on YouTube in general. There are 102, make it 103, public videos on my channel, and another 60 or so that are unlisted or private. I've been doing YouTube on and off for eight years now. I don't have a large following, so it's not like I believe that I've earned the right to give anyone advice or anything, or that anybody really cares about this at all. Because in the grand scheme of things, I'm a nobody. It would be the blind leading the blind. But on the other hand, some of my favorite content on YouTube are these types of things. One of the best AVGN episodes is his making of episode. Kadikaris, somebody I don't usually watch, has a fascinating one. Square Eye Jack, if you've ever heard of him, does these behind the scenes types of videos all the time, and they always fascinate me. I love seeing how everyone else goes about doing this whole YouTube thing. Again, I'm sure most of you won't care, but if anyone here is like me, heck, maybe you'll get a kick of seeing how I do things. Maybe you create or have thought about making your own YouTube videos. Maybe this has techniques or tips that you can incorporate into your own work. Hell, if anyone has suggestions about how I could do things better, then let me know. I'd love to hear them. Here's a little tip if you're recording audio from a different source as your video. Do some claps to make it easy to sync them up. So when you're editing, you can just look for the spikes and make sure the spikes all line up with each other. Step one before you do anything is to pick a topic. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. Most of the time on this channel, that just means pick a video game to review. And in this case, we have it right here. RPG Maker Super Dante is the topic of this video. Kind of. We're not really going to be talking about the video very much. This is something that I've wanted to cover, or that I want to cover for obvious reasons, but... There's not really a lot to say about it. It's an RPG Maker game. It's old. It's on the Super Nintendo. So obviously it's very archaic. And I'm using this as an excuse to get meta with this video. Talking about how I make YouTube videos. This is a game about making games. So this is a video about making videos. After picking a topic, then I'll normally check out YouTube and see what other videos are out there before deciding if I actually want to go ahead with it. Unless, of course, it's a Super Nintendo RPG because I'm stuck with those. I'm pre-committing to doing those. You can still obviously do games and topics that others have done before you, but it's about whatever I think I can add or whatever you think you can add, or if I could find a unique angle on something. I have a huge list of games and topics that I would like to do someday. For example, Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. I have wanted to talk about that game for years, but there existed videos such as this one that Fudge made, which blows whatever I could have done out of the water, so I held off on doing it until I got the idea to just do a whole bunch of Yu-Gi-Oh! games all at once. Another recent example, that before I even started working on Yu-Gi-Oh! Instead of that one, my original plan was to do a video entitled In Defense of Zelda CDI, and then I would go and review all three Zelda CDI games through the lens of them not being anywhere close to the worst games of all time and the first two actually being pretty decent for what they are. I've played through them before so I already had that general opinion of them going in but then across my YouTube feed I see this video which basically comes to that same conclusion and it's really well made to boot. Who knows I may still do the Zelda CDI game someday but seeing someone else tackle the same topic I wanted to do was hugely demotivating especially since it's a really great video. I don't want to compete with this. Sometimes there are just a million videos about a given game, so there's no real point in me saying anything about it. For example, a while ago I wanted to do Mega Man Legends, but then I looked it up and that may be the single most reviewed game on this website. If you've produced retro game review videos on the internet, I swear there's like a 50-50 shot that you've done Mega Man Legends. No matter how simple, Every video involves the same steps. Playing the game, writing the script, shooting the video and recording the voiceover, and editing the video. I come from basically the same school of thought. James is my biggest inspiration for starting YouTube, me along with tons of other people, so... It's natural, I guess, that I would do things in sort of the same roundabout way. I would say the biggest thing is not 
to write your videos from memory. Like you can't write the video and then play the game because a lot of times you'll find that what you remember about a game isn't always, it doesn't always line up with reality. So you're trying to manufacture reasons to like backfill the opinions that you already had. Obviously I talk about games that I've played before a lot, but I always replay them just to make sure that what I thought about them beforehand is what I still think. And a lot of times my opinion changes, so... Yeah, like, do your due diligence. Don't just pick a game that you like and then just start writing. Actually sit down, go through the whole process of playing the game, and then you can move on with the process. I play my games in a variety of ways. For the SNES RPGs, I have an original Super Nintendo, but I'd say my go-to is this little guy, the Super Nintendo Classic. You can load it up with whatever Super Nintendo games you want, but the compatibility isn't always there. I would say nine out of 10 times it's compatible, but sometimes it isn't. For example, I remember that Dungeon Master, Fire Emblem, Mystery of the Emblem, and Robo Trek for some reason are not compatible. I like playing on original hardware, but it's so expensive, such as Harvest Moon, that game is hundreds of dollars. I've thought about getting an EverDrive, but the good ones, which support things like the Super FX chip, are well over 200 bucks, and I just can't swing that at this stage of my life. Luckily for me, with that game, they actually just added Harvest Moon to the Switch Online. I love it when I get to review a Switch game because of its 30 second clip feature. Whenever something noteworthy happens, you can just hold down the clip button and it records the last 30 seconds of gameplay. Then when you're done with the game, you can just plug your Switch into your computer and transfer the clips over. It's much easier to use a folder full of 30 second clips than it is to use huge multi-hour chunks. Just because they're easier to name and organize, you can find the footage you're looking for so much easier this way. The great thing about video games, and retro games in specific, is that there are so many ways to play everything these days. It's a hobby that can be as cheap or as expensive as you want it to be. If you have a computer, it doesn't even need to be a good one, then you instantly have access to basically every game ever made before the year 2000, and many after that as well. I also have a Retron 4. Five, but I haven't used that thing in years and to the best of my memory I think I only used that for one review. I'm a stickler for using the original controllers. I've had this SNES to USB adapter for the past, I don't know, 14 or 15 years when emulating on PC. I have the entire line of Nintendo produced replica wireless NES, SNES, N64, and Genesis controllers. These are great because they're Bluetooth and can connect to any PC as well as your Switch. So whenever I'm playing a Super Nintendo game, I'm always using a Super Nintendo controller in some form. For capturing the game, I've only ever used the Elgato line of cards, and they've been good to me overall. Once in a while my footage might get corrupted, but it's rare, and even when it happens, it's hard to know whether to blame the software or the hardware. Personally, I think the bundled software that comes with these is fucking terrible and I never use it. Their newer one, 4K Video Capture, is much better than the old Elgato HD Capture or whatever that program was called, but it's still not something that I use. There's no reason to use anything other than OBS, ever, as far as I'm concerned. It works with everything, it's more customizable. Just use OBS, don't, don't fuck with the Elgato software. I have this old model Elgato, which only supports 1080 30 frames per second, and the video preview which shows up on your computer is also delayed a few seconds, which can be annoying. The reason I hang on to this thing is because it's the only capture card I have which accepts anything other than HDMI. This one right here is the one I use the most. It's normally plugged into my laptop where the footage records onto this micro SD card, which I then transfer over to my desktop PC, which is what I use to edit everything. I've got two monitors, but this old TV up here is also hooked up and can be used as a third. It's a little awkward, but it does the job as a third monitor up there. I don't know how anyone edits video with only one monitor or on a laptop or something. 
I basically only use the one on the right as my source and preview windows. Then all of the primary editing functions are on my main monitor. I also have this internal PCI Elgato, which supports 4K and is nice, but I don't even have a 4K TV or compatible monitor anymore. And this Elgato isn't even in my PC right now because I have this tiny motherboard that I had to order as an emergency because my old one died. And the only available PCI slot is being used by my Bluetooth and Wi-Fi adapter. So after I've picked a game and determined how I'm going to play it, Next comes the easiest, but also the most time-consuming part most of the time, and that is sitting down and actually playing the game. Obviously, this will vary wildly from title to title. With something like RPG Maker here, RPG Maker Super Dante, it's not really a game as much as is just software that you kind of mess around in, so I don't expect to play it for very long. Also, I've got it running back there. I have the game, but obviously I'm going to emulate because that's in Japanese and I can't do much with it. There are, exists fan translations, so in that case, you just download the fan translator, you patch it to the original Japanese ROM using Lunar IPS, which is this ancient program that's probably existed for like 30 years. And away you go with your Japanese games, but in those cases, you need to emulate somehow. Most of the time I put them on the Super Nintendo Mini, but it's kind of a pain to add more games to that. So a long time ago, I just kind of loaded it up with all the RPGs and that's what's on there currently. For something like this that I didn't even know existed until maybe a month ago, I'm just going to boot it up in RetroArch and play it that way. Every game I've done a standalone review of, I've at least finished. I believe with only one exception, at least with what's publicly up on my channel at the moment. In my Final Fantasy Adventure video from over three years ago, I didn't finish that for some reason. And I don't really know why. I got pretty far, but then just stopped playing it. Like I threw up my arms and was like, all right, I'm far enough into the game, I can make a video now. With collection videos where I'm doing a whole bunch of games like Namco Museum or Barbie or whatever, I don't hold myself to the same standard, but I still try my best to get through them. Like in the Barbie video, I beat all the games that you you could beat but if i'm just doing a quick overview of a bunch of games then i don't force myself to get through all those i have not or at least not yet anyway had to give up on any snes rpg game i would say that spellcraft and fire emblem mystery of the emblem were the closest i've came to tapping out but there's 45 verging on 46 videos in that playlist and I've beaten 45 games. Now I'm not Gerard the completionist or anything. I get to the end of the main quest and then maybe if I really love the game, I'll do all the completionist bull crap. I think this mentality where I always need to finish the game is both one of the fundamental flaws with my approach and is also paradoxically a part of the secret sauce which makes my videos work. Forcing myself to finish every standalone game I review horribly limits how often I'm able to upload. I average about two videos a month, which isn't great if you're looking to build an audience on YouTube. Not that I'm complaining, don't get me wrong. In the past, people have left comments saying something along the lines of, why doesn't this channel have more subscribers, or you should have 50,000 by now. I appreciate the kind words, but I don't really produce enough content quick enough to build up a sub count like that. At least not this quickly. Unless you're the top 1% of charismatic or an insanely innately talented video maker where you can just make a video and it'll go viral. You can't just make a couple videos and expect to build any kind of a following. It's a marathon, not a sprint. You just gotta keep turning them out. You constantly need to remind people that you exist or people forget and they just fall off. It's a balancing act. A big part of the appeal of my channel isn't that I'm reminiscing about these games or speaking on a 20 year old memory mixed with Wikipedia research, it's that I'm actually playing them through. There's far too many retro gaming YouTube channels out there which are just kind of shallow and they don't really speak on anything other than a game's first impressions or they'll just talk about how they used to play these games back in 1995 and this is how they remember feeling about it way back then. But not me, man. Like, I 
I don't know, I'm playing all of them for each video. I've had people ask how often my opinion of a game changes after this initial stage, questioning how much finishing a game shapes my review, or they'll inquire if it's really necessary to making my videos to get all the way through the game. And in terms of just the contents, as in what I end up saying about each game, I would say most of the time, no, it doesn't really affect it. I have generally what I'm going to say about a game worked out way before I'm done with it. In fact, I'd say it's rare that how a game ends significantly impacts how I feel about it, but I still like to do the due diligence of making it all the way through, just in case, because you don't always have everything figured out when you're like halfway through. Sometimes the game throws some curveballs at the end, and I'd like to see it if it does. You absolutely need to take notes while playing, it's mandatory. I have some older videos where I failed to do this, for example... Lagoon. Lagoon's a game I should have done a much better job on, but I kind of just played all the way through it and then freeballed it, and as a result, it's not very detailed because I was just going off of what I remembered off the top of my head. If you want to look at a similar game where I took extensive notes, Ultima Runes of Virtue is pretty similar to Lagoon. I have them in the same spot on my tier list, and I think they could have made for pretty similar videos. Like, if I were to go back and do Lagoon again, I think it would be a lot longer, and a lot, like, jokier, and a lot, like, riffier, more like that one, and that's just because I didn't take the time to take notes. Notes are really important, and my strategies for taking notes have changed quite a bit over the years. I've used physical pen and paper before, I've used Microsoft Word, I've used Excel, I've used Notepad, um, but these days, a lot of times I take notes on my phone. That's what I've gravitated towards the most. Oh man, I even went through a weird phase for like two or three videos where I, I took audio notes. When I was playing the game, I would, and I like had a thought, I would wheel over, I would swivel over my microphone, I would click on an Audacity file that I kept going through the whole playthrough, and I would just state aloud whatever my thought was. And then at the end of the game, I would have like 40 minutes of just me rambling incoherently that I would then have to listen back to and transcribe. Oh man, that was a really stupid way of taking notes. When you're playing a game, you never know what's going to end up being important to the overall video. There have been times when I've taken extensive notes with lots of timestamps and meticulous details about a certain aspect of a game because it seemed super important while playing, only for that element to barely factor into my final video because I never really know exactly what angle I'm going to take until I'm in the planning phases. I try to keep recordings shorter, like if I'm playing a game for three hours, I'll break up the recording into half hour chunks or something. Because as mentioned earlier, it's easier for me to work and keep organized a bunch of smaller clips than one big one. It's much easier for me to scrub through a 30 minute long file than a 300 minute long file. A large factor for me, which is easy to overlook, is motivation. How do I keep myself motivated to do all this? Now I know for some people that's an asinine question because they have a strong sense of internal motivation, but historically that's never been me. I've always been the type of guy to do nothing for months at a time. When I was a teenager, I would go to school, go home, play video games, play basketball if it was basketball season, and that is it. I wouldn't talk to anybody, I wasn't building things. I wouldn't do anything productive with my time at all. I never even did homework. I would regularly fail classes where my final exam scores were over 90. In New York, we have these state tests called the Regents exams that everybody takes at the end of the year. My junior year, I had a perfect 100 in two of them, but still managed to fail both classes and had to go to summer school because I was so lazy, I would refuse to do even a shred of homework. It was like I would go home and enter a coma until it was time for me to go back to school. And it makes me sick to think that I used to live my life that way. Even today, my natural instinct is to be as lazy as possible. A day doing everything I naturally want to do is a day spent doing absolutely nothing. And I mean nothing. I don't mean like the royal nothing. I mean, I sit in a chair all day and drool and do absolutely nothing. My natural state of being is a lazy piece of shit, and I've wasted most of my life doing nothing. 
I need to actively think about and fight the urge to be lazy every day or else I slip right back into sloth again. And the best way that I've found to keep myself motivated with anything is to force myself to touch on a project every single day. It doesn't have to be the same project. It doesn't even need to be for very long. I just tell myself that I'm going to work on something for a little bit, like I'll force myself to open Premiere or boot up whatever game I'm playing. Tell myself it'll just be for a minute. It'll just be for five or 10 minutes. And most of the time, just opening up the program or booting up the game leads to something more because the largest barrier to overcome is committing yourself mentally to a task. Once you're doing it, it's easier to continue doing it than it is to stop. And if you ever wanna get anything done, be it large or small, getting started is always the hardest part. So if you can force yourself to get started, then you can be more productive. Once I've beaten a game, that's when it's time to formally transition into the writing process. And I don't just open Word and start typing or just like going off my notes and start typing. I know a lot of people get their best work done when they are freewheeling it like that, but not me. I really need to have a plan of what I'm going to write before I start writing. I don't remember when or how or why I came up with this, but for as long as I could remember, I've always used Microsoft Excel to plan my videos. Or actually, I prefer LibreOffice Calc because it's easier to click and drag the cells around. Basically, what I do is I'll transcribe my notes to Excel, then I'll color code everything. Story is blue, gameplay is red, ideas specifically for how I want to start a video are in yellow, and anything else I can't categorize, I make green. While my my note taking may have changed quite a bit over the years. This hasn't for some reason. It's how I planned my first video about Dragon Power. It's how I planned the latest video about Yu-Gi-Oh games. It's how I planned every paper I wrote in college. And I would say that it's how I planned every paper I wrote in high school, but I never did any fucking work in high school, so that's probably not true. I'm pretty sure nobody ever taught me this. It's just something I came up with on my own. And I find it very useful to be able to arrange my ideas in whatever order I want by just clicking and dragging. It helps to have this visual representation that I can so easily manipulate so I'll arrange my overall ideas in a way that is coherent. Sometimes if I have a lot of things to say, I'll have over a hundred bullet points. But other times if I really don't have much, then I may have as few as ten. If that happens, and I'm not doing an every SNES RPG episode, most of the time I'll just scrap the video and start on something else. But if it's a Super Nintendo RPG, then I have no choice but to push through this and think of some topics to discuss. These situations are frustrating and sometimes results in a poor video, but shockingly, forcing myself to push through this lack of things to say conundrum has resulted in some of my best work. My least favorite episode of every SNES RPG has to be my Final Fantasy V one, and its Excel document was only a couple of bullet points, so I spent the whole video complaining that I had nothing to say about the game, and that's really lame. On the other hand, my Robotrek episode came out fairly well because I used the game as a springboard to talk about more general topics. I'll admit that my video is not a great review of Robotrek, but I managed to salvage a worthwhile video out of it by shifting my talking points to a higher, more abstract level. In this case, with RPG Maker Super Dante, I knew going in that I wouldn't end up with many bullet points, and after playing the game, I don't. But I'm not really worried about it because the actual game review is only going to be a small part of this video that you're currently watching, and I expect the how-to portion to fill much more runtime. After everything is planned out on the Excel document, it's finally time to open up Word. And when it gets to this point, I'm a fucking machine. My Yu-Gi-Oh video is almost 6,000 words, and I wrote the whole thing in one sitting. I write incredibly fast, I don't pay much attention attention to spelling or grammar because after all I'm the only one who's going to see this and I always reserve the right to change my wording around when reading it aloud. There's no set formula, I just hit each bullet point one at a time, expounding upon whatever I said in the Excel document. Basically, my spreadsheet serves as a bunch of tiny little writing prompts that I just go down the list answering until I have a completed script. When I run out of bullet points, then I do shoutouts, I say my catchphrase, and that's it, script done. 
Even if the process has been the same, my writing style has changed quite a bit from when I started every SNES RPG up until now. If you go back and watch my Final Fantasy II video, for example, I wrote that more like how I would write a college paper or something. Back in those days, I used to keep thesaurus.com open. I would use websites that would analyze my sentence structure and vocabulary, and I would go through multiple drafts of the same script using fancier language and more academically correct sentences. I would really polish these up, but I've gotten far away from that. I only do one draft now. I don't use a thesaurus at all anymore, because at some point I realized that I'm writing to speak. Specifically, I'm writing for me to speak, and I don't talk like that. If a word isn't in my vocabulary, then why the hell am I using it in a script? I don't like making my points sound as if they mean more than they do. If I were to explain my writing style, it's that I strive to be concise. It's that I'm direct and to the spot. I try to avoid plot summary unless I'm making a specific point and you need to know plot elements to understand what I'm saying. This goes against the common YouTube video essay style that's so popular these days. All the time I see huge videos, multi-hour long epics that I click on, and it's just the person summarizing their playthrough of a game. Just listing off everything that happened in the same order that it did. I find that shit hackney. It's formulaic, it's a shortcut to making a long ass video while putting minimal thought into it. I also don't like to harp on the same point for too long. I'm not shitting on this guy, don't think that I am, but somebody like King K can hammer on one point for 20 minutes, but he makes it entertaining so it works. I can't do that. If anything, I need to fight my urge to move on from topics so fast because I'm guilty in the past of not fully explaining what I mean sometimes. Like I'll assume that the viewer will be in the same headspace as me, failing to realize that in order to get them there, sometimes I need to more fully explain a topic or even repeat my main points multiple times to get them there. Brevity is nice, but it gets people lost sometimes. But I'm continually attempting to diagnose these problems and working to get better at explaining myself. Once a video is written, it's now time to record the voiceover. This is one of, if not the most important skill to have as a YouTuber. You will only go as far as your voice will take you. Unfortunately, that means you're stuck with the pipes you got, but you can always work to make yourself better. I have a bad case of mush mouth, so I need to make an extra effort to enunciate my words or else everything just blends together. I'm conscious of this, but I'm still guilty of not fully pronouncing every word that I say. Of course, you need to have the right technology. My setup is by no means fancy. I use an AT2020 XLR edition. This microphone also exists as a USB, but those are inherently worse because in order to transfer your audio data, data over that cable to your computer, they need to compress the fuck out of your voice. I used a Blue Yeti for years, I'm sure you've seen those around, they're one of the most popular microphones for YouTube, you can buy them at any Walmart for around a hundred bucks. But go back and listen to my old videos, it's like night and day. Then in 2018, this is the game for you. I upgraded to an XLR setup with this interface and I've never looked back. I will never use a USB microphone ever again. If you're thinking about making the switch, I highly recommend it. When recording, get rid of all obvious noisemakers in the room. Depending on your living situation, there's only so much you can do. Back when I had my own apartment, not only would I turn off the AC, I would unplug my fridge, of all things, before recording anything. Because you never realize how loud those things are until you hear them in the background of your audio recordings. Unfortunately now, I don't have the same control over my audio situation. I live in this house with my aunt and uncle in Florida, so I can only feasibly turn off the AC if neither one of them are home, and it's rare that I have the house to myself, so most of the time it is to stay on. Don't have any ceiling fans running, don't have YouTube going on in the background, turn off your game consoles, get as quiet of a PC as you can, you know, typical stuff. The shittier your microphone, the more you need to cater your surrounding area to making it work. I'm by no means an audiophile, so it's not like my sound is perfect either, but it's better than what it was way back then. I use Audacity to record everything. It's the only recording software that I've ever used and it's never once let me down. 
After I'm done speaking, I run the built-in noise reduction, then normalize the volume, then export my raw track as a WAV file. When doing voiceover, you need to bring some energy to it. Don't put on like a stupid YouTuber voice, but don't speak naturally either. If you try to do voiceover like how you talk to people in real life, it comes off as emotionless and low energy on tape. This is just something that you need to grow into by doing. It's rare that you'll have your voiceover style down right away. As for recording session length, most of the time I do everything in one sitting, but for longer videos that's not always the case. I think Yu-Gi-Oh! is about the maximum I can do in one take. By the end of that, my throat was getting sore and I was losing my voice. But this video right now is giving it a run for its money. I'll leave notes for myself in the voiceover track as well. Like if I think of an idea of how I want to visually edit something beforehand, I'll say it during the recording session. Or if I have a timestamp for a specific gameplay clip I know that I'll want to use here, then I'll say something like session six, 32 minutes in. Then when I'm editing and I hear that, I'll know where to look for the footage. So my voiceover track will alternate between me reading the script and me coaching my future self on how to edit the video. Just like how I color code my notes, I also color code my script, but this time it's only two tones. Black is regular voiceover and red means live in front of the camera. I never write specific lines for myself on camera because I'm incapable of remembering them. Once I get in front of the camera, they're fucking gone every time. I used to try to memorize entire paragraphs, but I wasn't able to do it, so then I shortened it to sentences, then like phrases, and eventually what I landed on was just writing bullet points for myself on camera. They're usually taken straight out of my Excel document. In this case, instead of writing prompts, they're speaking prompts prompts. For example, last time I was on camera in this video, the only thing it says in the script is talk about how you need to plan before you write. And then whatever comes out of my mouth is what makes it into the video. After recording all the black lines, I'll trudge all my equipment out to wherever I'm filming. I use the same microphone as the voiceovers, the same audio interface, my laptop, tripods, and for a camera, I just use my phone. Currently, I have a gas Galaxy Z Fold 4. My last phone, which I still have as a backup camera, is a Galaxy 21 Plus. Before that, I had the 19. And before that, back when I started this channel, I had a Galaxy 2. So yeah, I'm a Samsung guy. I guess that's the only phone I ever get. Even though most of my videos are only in 720p, I film the live action parts in 4K. Not that you could tell, because they still normally look like crap. I do this because my phone is able to, and I figure why not. It's better to have a bigger frame and then choose what I want to use than have a smaller one and not have enough. I'll be the first to recognize and tell you that being on camera, like right now, is not a strength of mine, but I view it like a muscle that I need to exercise because I think it's a useful tool and the only way that I'm going to get better at doing things like this is if I keep doing them. So I'm kind of in a catch-22. Like I don't think they actively make the videos worse, but I also don't think they add a whole lot. And if, I guess if something's not adding anything to a video, then it is making it worse. So who knows, maybe in the future I may cut back on the amount of time that I'm on camera. Like in this video, this video could have been me entirely on camera. But I decided to do, to do uh, mostly a voiceover approach with B-roll. Just because I'm not supernatural on camera and I don't think I can carry a whole video that way. So now that we have all the ingredients... It's time to actually make the video. I've always used Adobe Premiere. In 2015, when I started this channel, it was a case where I googled what the best editing software was, then went on Pirate Bay and downloaded a cracked copy of the 2015 release. And that was the same install I used all the way up until last year when I made the switch to non-pirated software. I use the legitimate release of Premiere now, but it's not software you can just buy once and use. It's a subscription service, so... I need to pay the wolf every month just to use it. I'm completely self-taught and before starting YouTube had never used anything more advanced than Windows Movie Maker. I always edit with headphones. I have these Sennheisers 280 Pros. You absolutely have to get used to the sound of your own voice because it's incredibly jarring the first, second, 
or even 50th time you hear it. I used to hate how my voice sounded, and I still don't necessarily enjoy it, but I'm at least used to it now. I can tolerate it enough to get through editing. Before I lay down any visuals, I like to cut up my audio first. That means removing pauses between sentences, removing flubs, sometimes stitching together two sentences to make one. This is the part which is the most like manual labor. There's no real thought required, you just have to sit down and do it. I've used Audacity's truncate silence feature in the past, but I was never happy with the result, so I manually cut my own audio again. Much like my writing, my editing has experienced a few changes over the years. After experimenting with fancier styles, I realized that I wasn't very good at them, so now I just keep things as simple as possible. I used to never know what to do with the borders, because I mainly talk about retro games that are in 4x3, it leaves the sides of the screen with nothing going on. Do I put a solid color back there? Do I try to ape Tim Rogers' style of having geometric shapes floating around back there? Do I have the same gameplay footage I'm showing, only zoomed in and in a grayscale? Do I just keep it black? The solution that I've landed on, and I think I'm gonna stick with this forever, is to fit the aspect ratio of my video to whatever game I'm talking about. A Super Nintendo RPG will always be 4x3, but something like my Yu-Gi-Oh! video was in 3x2 because that's the aspect ratio of the Game Boy Advance and that's what I spend most of the video talking about. Where if I'm reviewing a modern game, it will be the standard 16x9. If the gameplay fills the entire screen, then you can't have a border problem if there's no borders. For the editing process itself, my only real advice is don't be lazy. Show the clip. If you're talking about something specific, take the time to track down the appropriate clips. This is the most time-consuming and annoying part of the editing process, but it's worth it. It's so easy to just toss up one clip and let it play for 30 seconds, which is okay if you're just talking about general topics, but anything specific requires visual evidence. As I'm going, I'll leave gaps in the timeline where I either can't find or am missing footage. I always have a notepad document up with a list of missing shots. This can be gameplay or live action or b-roll. A lot of times it's easier for me to stage gameplay than it is to find an example from the footage I've already recorded. For a basic example, if I wanted to talk about the menus or something in a game, instead of combing through my footage for when I interact interact with the menu on whichever way I want to comment on it. I'll jot it down in my notepad, then when I get to the end of the video, I'll go back and get all the footage that I'm missing to fill in the gaps. So I'll sit down with the game again and I'll get footage that represents what I'm talking about. The video you're watching right now is going to have a crap load of b-roll, probably more than I've ever put into a video ever, and all of that was filmed after I already edited together the rough cut so I knew exactly what footage I needed. Usually I'll leave myself a little text box on screen in the video to remind myself what footage is supposed to go there. For a normal video, I'll only need to do like four or five of these shots. But again, for this one, most of the video is going to be these shots, so it should be interesting. At some point during all this, I need to make a thumbnail too. That usually happens when I'm sick of editing for the day, but I still want to get some work done. I had somebody else making my thumbnails for me for a bit. Alkahest up until Shin Megami Tensei If were made by my friend Jonas, but since then I've been making them myself again, and they've become way more dynamic. Sometimes I put my face in, sometimes I don't, sometimes I have a specific vision and inspiration, other times I don't. Recently I analyzed my click-through rates and learned something shocking that it really doesn't matter what I do with my thumbnails because there's almost no rhyme or reason to how often people click. I like to think that my newer thumbnails blow these older gray background ones away, but my click-through rates don't reflect that in any way, so... Even videos with the laziest thumbnails possible are in line with the rest of them, so... Fuck it, it doesn't really matter. The only potential discernible success metric I can even begin to come up with is that placing an attractive female character prominently appears to help 
because the original Lufia and my Chrono Cross video have two of the highest CTRs on my channel. After making the thumbnail and inserting the pickup shots, that's about it. The video is done. It's become a tradition for me at this point to put the finished product onto a USB drive, then into my Xbox when I watch the whole thing from beginning to end. I would say two out of three times at this point I'll notice something that needs to be changed. So most videos end up getting rendered a few times to fix some minor issues. Is this when I celebrate because I'm done? No, because you always need to be continuously looking ahead to whatever's next. One video ends is when another begins. I know there's always a strong urge to take some time off but you can never rest on your laurels or I'll fade into nothing. I almost always have another project lined up to start on right away, and in the rare cases I don't, I normally only give myself one day to commit to something. It's more important to be doing something than to decide on the perfect topic, at least for the way I do things. I always need to have my eyes on the future because if I don't, then I won't get anything done. Well anyway, I've blathered on long enough about my process, so let's check out the Super Dante review. Hey you, kid. Yeah you, here, come here. Do you like video games? Yeah. Have you ever wanted to make your own video games? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you like the Super Nintendo? Mm -hmm. Do you like turn-based Japanese role-playing games? Have you ever wanted to make your own turn-based Japanese role-playing video game on your Super Nintendo? I like Minecraft. I like to play Bed Wars. Introducing RPG maker Super Dante. Why Super Dante? I have no idea. If you're unfamiliar, RPG Maker is a line of software designed to make it easy for anyone with the time and drive to do it to be able to produce traditional turn-based RPGs. It was first released, believe it or not, all the way back in 1992, and it's primarily known as a PC application, but over the years they put out various console editions, most famously on the PlayStation, but most recently on the 3DS, and of course, hence the topic of this video on Super Nintendo, or Super Famicom, because it obviously never left Japan. RPG Maker is still a thing today. I'm most familiar with MV, the 2015 release, but they put out a newer one in 2020. I wouldn't call myself a master by any means, but I know generally how the program works. Since this only came out in Japan, even though I have the cartridge, the only way for me to really attempt to play it is through fan translations. And it constantly blows my mind the amount of Japan-only RPGs that have translations. Super Dante has one, but it's not fully complete. Most of the text is this garbled mix of multiple languages. Some of the most basic menus they got down, but once you get into the weeds, it, you're SOL. Quite a few of the menus are in English, but not enough for me to figure out how to do much of anything. I think it's a mix of not being particularly user-friendly and the translation simply being incomplete. It includes a sample game, but again, all the text are these garbage values. I got this cute princess to join my party, but... I have absolutely no idea how to progress or anything. I found a woman who allows me to save. I made it out to the overworld, but it's this really small area, and there doesn't appear to be any way out. Is this the whole sample? Is this something I can beat? I guess I'll never know if there's an ending or anything. Super Dante's game creation tools are shockingly in-depth. You can customize enemies, equipment, NPCs, obviously all the dialogue, every stat. Unfortunately, you're stuck with pre-made assets, limitations of this being a Super Nintendo game after all. Whatever you create would also be unfortunately stuck on the cartridge. Even though they did produce a peripheral which allowed you to save your game to that and then transfer it to other people's systems, it's not like there was any way to commercially sell what you create. And there's also a hard limit as to how much you can actually put into your game before it just refuses to save. This is a cartridge game after all, and there's only a limited amount of space. RPG Maker Super Dante was obviously intended for children who could not afford a computer of their own. It's nowhere near a serious game development tool, which 
should be obvious. It's a neat little curiosity, and believe it or not, there was actually a follow-up on the Super Nintendo. Sort of. It's a Satellaview game. Believe it or not, this thing has actually never come up on my show before. It's pretty well known these days, but I'll briefly explain the Satellaview anyway. It was a modem only released in Japan, which allowed you to download Super Nintendo, or Super Famicom games rather, onto this special cartridge. There were a staggering 77 original games produced for the service, with the most famous titles perhaps being BS Zelda, a Super Mario All-Stars-esque remake of the original Zelda, Radical Dreamers, the visual novel follow-up to Chrono Trigger, and F-Zero Grand Prix 2, the sequel to the original Super Nintendo launch game. There was some other wild stuff too that I didn't even know about until now, such as an updated Mario paint and an Excitebike sequel starring Mario characters. The Citeleview was supported all the way up until 2000, which is impressive. Anyway, onto RPG Maker Super Dante 2. The fan translation and user interface are actually a bit better in this one. Enough anyway that I can actually stumble around these menus and figure some stuff out. So after about half an hour of tinkering, let's see what I can come up with. Welcome to the world of Jason's very cool RPG. There is trouble in SNES land. This group of assholes are going from town to town selling Poison Mountain Dew. Venture forth kick their asses. Then your mom wakes you up. Jesus Christ, it's almost 3 p.m. So there's this Mountain Dew festival going on. Try my orange pumpkin spice dew. Boo. Now try my dew of the dead. Pretty much all you can do is talk to people and then they tell you their flavor of Mountain Dew. Then you talk to this old lady behind the counter and she gives you the poison dew. Ooh, sounds delicious. Actually, it just sounds like normal Mountain Dew. And then it poisons you. And that's as far as I got. Again, these are interesting tools, but they're not exactly fun or worth using these days. Very cool that Super Dante exists, but it's not going on the tier list because it's not a game. It's just a little something you fiddle around in. That's all I got. I hope you enjoyed me pulling back the curtain a bit. I always find other people's workflows fascinating, so hopefully at least somebody took something out of this or they found it interesting. Shout out to the patrons, as always, shout out to William Robert Lee. Never trust anyone who needs a haircut. Goodbye.